Hi, everyone. This is Jeffrey Geisner for the Obligations of Memory podcast for the Jewish Culture and Holocaust Remembrance Group on Facebook and YouTube. And I'm delighted to have with me my friend and colleague, Michael Simonson from the Leo Beck Institute in New York City. And we're going to be talking about what the Leo Beck Institute is doing uh, for Holocaust education, for Jewish artifacts. And we might as well start right there and allow you to kind of give us and a lot of our listeners may not know about Leo Beck, and sure. it would be great for you to sort of start the program by giving us a sense of who is Leo Beck, what is Leo Beck, and its mission. So take it away, Michael. Sure, sure. So um, the organization, the Leo Beck Institute, um, is located in a few, there's a few locations. Um, it's named after Rabbi Leo Beck. Uh, he was the head of German Jewry in Germany at the time of the um, Holocaust. He uh, had served as a rabbi in Lisa, um, a few other places, and then in, Ber in, Oberschle in Oberschlesen, and then in um, Berlin itself. At the time uh, the Nazis took power, he became uh, kind of head of the Jewish administration for Germany. And in that role, as things worsened, he tried to keep the community together, positive, um, to deal with anti-Semitism, Nazi anti-Semitism. And of course, this soon turned into immigration I mean, no one could imagine what was going to happen with the Holocaust, but it was clear from a very early point that there was no future for young Jewish people in Germany as far as professions or education. So they, the administration began to work to get children and younger people out of Germany. If they what, year, what, what year are you highlighting? 33 to 38. Okay. 33 to 38. And then... Um, uh, so Dr. Beck, uh, he said that he was going to stay and continue to serve in Germany until the last Jew had immigrated or had gotten out of the country. Well, things worsened, as we know, people couldn't get visas, they couldn't get out. There were a lot of, especially elderly people stuck in Germany and he uh, stayed with them. And in the end, in early 1943, was they ported to Theresienstadt, or Terezin, as it's often called. And uh, well, he was there. He was, um, he survived. You know, he was somewhat of a prominent person. So this helped him survive. And without being further deported uh, to Auschwitz, which was usually what happened. That's what happened to almost everyone who was brought to Terezin. And um, after well, the war- can I, can I ask you? Um, when you said he was helping people get out from 33 to 38, what mechanisms was he using? And I'll tell you, my father, who was in Berlin, got out um, through the um, Hadassah Aliot kinder transport in mm -hmm. 1936, early 36. So I'm wondering if you know which particular uh, organizations were getting people out. Yeah, that's certainly one. There were many organizations, actually. And... Um, you know, Dr. Beck was not committed to one way of getting people out, any way people would get out. And um, so, so all kinds of resources and organizations were used. Okay. So what happened is um, at the end of the war, uh, Rabbi Beck joined his daughter in England. His daughter had immigrated before the war and was in Eng safely in England in London. Um, but he also, with some other people, Martin Buber being one of them, some other known German Jewish figures at the end of the war, they um, wanted to preserve the history of German Jewish scholarship. It started as like preserving the great academic works that German Jews had created in Germany um, and Austria um, in the period preceding and in the early years of the Shoah. So um, this, so the Leo Beck Institute named after him um, and included all these kind of central figures 
of German Jewish thought that were still living, who had survived the Holocaust, mostly by immigrating in time, getting out. Uh, it was founded in Jerusalem in 1955. There was a small archive there. So basically donations of people who had made it to Israel. And then um, they opened up a branch in London. Leo Beck lived in London after all, but that branch is not a research branch. It doesn't, I believe, have a library or an archive. It's, um, it's really for publication, like publishing um, academic papers and the yearbook. We have a yearbook that comes out every year. And then we have um, our location here in New York where I work in the archives. Um, and that is where New York is the biggest Leo Beck Institute. And where are you in, where are you located in New York? Um, we're located close to Union Square. So um, between 5th and 6th Avenue on 16th Street. So pretty central, okay. really. The village is just a few blocks south, and then Chelsea's just a few blocks away. Now you also have an office in Germany, right? We have an office in Germany. That's part of the Jewish Museum Berlin. Now that has been collecting material, and it's been getting more and more. Um, but I think the material they collect is largely from outside of Germany. So they have to kind of make special trips and do a little more legwork to go and meet people and get the material. Um, one thing they have is our collections as well on microfilm. So people can um, go to the Jewish Museum Berlin and go to the Leo Beck offices and ask for a collection we have. In the old days, they get it on microfilm, but now we have a huge digitization project that's gone on many years. So most of our materials digitized and so microfilm is rarely used. So needed. do you have a website where the, these, these digitized yeah, images uh, are? Yep, yeah, it's, it's our main website. It's um, www.lbi.org. On the upper right, there's a search field. When you put the cursor there, you can choose to search in the catalog and then type in whatever terms you want and you'll get a list of results. And then there'll be this choice for almost everything in the archive saying online access. And you click on that and then you begin the journey through the original material. Okay, so how many people are working at Leo Beck in the around the world? Around the world, I can't say. I would, well, I can, I can kind of estimate maybe. Uh, maybe. <laughs> That's kind of funny. Maybe 55. Okay. And so let's, <laughs> let's tell everyone in the audience what your title is for Leo Beck, how long you've been there, how, yeah. you, got, how you got there, and a little bit about your background. Sure, sure. So I, um, and I have a few titles, actually. I started as an archivist at the Leo Beck Institute, and I specialized in, mic in the microfilm program, which has now ended. Um, then I became a rep the head of reference. We have a reference department, the Dr. Robert Ira Louie Reference Services. What's a, what, is the, what does reference mean? Um, if anyone has a question and they write to the Leo Beck, that question comes to me. Gotcha. Yeah, so um, uh, through the main inbox, also people write me directly. Most of our reference is handled now through email. And um, that's actually the official policy. We try not to do reference through phone calls and stuff because the problem with that is it takes time to find the material. And then the other person's on the phone waiting and waiting and waiting. And uh -huh. you know, it's, it often takes a long time. So we, we do it through um, email. And um, for the most part, and so I'm head of that. So I get, it's, it's great. I get to answer all kinds of questions. Some very, uh, you know, maybe on point to the subject, very academic. I also answer a lot of genealogy questions. Um, and, and, well, I, think and that's how, I think that's how we met, is I think I wrote about a specific topic. Yeah. just to the general inbox and that's how we met i think right yeah and, that, and also vera myers from uh, jenks on facebook also recommended I, and yeah. you have and why don't you tell a little bit about your role for that group too sure i'm happy to so i help vera meyer administer that group vera really runs the group it's her group but i'm happy to kind of monitor it as much as i can and if if um 
if there's decisions that have to be made about things people have posted and so on, then um, she reaches out to me or I see the post and I reach out to her and we discuss what to do. Questionable posts, let's say. Yeah. Things maybe a little off topic. And so then just kind of organizing the page and, and helping to answer people's questions. Sometimes. So when you get the reference um, information coming at you, uh -huh. is, it, is it sort of bucketed into some major groups that you can share with us? that are most of the most of what you're dealing with is sort of like an 80 20 rule where you know 80% of your questions are always in this particular area yeah i would say half of my questions are in genealogy then about 20 20% more will have to do with um the holocaust and then maybe 20% more other aspects of German Jewish history in particular. And I would say the last 10% can be really pretty random because a lot of people come to Leo Beck and they're writing about topics that aren't necessarily German Jewish at all, but they happen to be Jewish people who are involved. So someone might be writing a book about World War I. Of course, we have lots of stuff from World War I because uh, Jews in both Germany and Austria served their countries in the First World War in, in very high numbers. So I know your grandfather was one of them. Right. And, uh, and so people might be coming to write about a certain battle in World War I. Someone might be coming, someone came the other day, they were doing research on the history of nursing in Germany. And we have a lot of collections of Jewish women who became nurses. So how do people they find, were, how do people find Leo Beck and know what questions to ask you. So well, our audience is sitting here listening and say they're all they're all very into the Holocaust topic. Genealogy is, is huge, um, but mm -hmm. a lot of the things that Leo Beck is doing. But how does the audience, how does the consumer come to you and know about you? Right. No, it's true, and it's tricky because people don't really know. We aren't like the Holocaust Museum in Washington, for example, that has a big, that's a large presence. And you know, that's a little bit about the history of the institute. We're very focused on Germany and Austria, German speaking, so we don't collect anything, for example, from Eastern Europe, unless it has to be, unless it's from people who spoke German and identified culturally as German. And um, same with other places. Of course, we have stuff from everywhere because German Jews, especially when they fled in the 30s, went to many of these other countries. And so we therefore do have material on the Holocaust in Holland and France and Poland and this and that, but as it relates to these families. And um, so, so I would say we have a more, so um, a larger social media presence than we used to have. We used to be considered a very small, very academic place. In fact, the Leo Beck was started by these men in 1955 to gather this material. And then they were gonna write a book. I think it was supposed to be a four volume set or something of the history of Jewish scholarship in the German lands. And then this idea changed over time. And actually that was published by uh, Michael Meyer Professor Michael Meyer um, a number of years ago now, but we do have a four volume set using Leo Beck material. But um, uh, that was originally how it started. But what happened is it was somewhat based on the collections because people um, donate their material to us, their archival material, photo albums, pictures, vital documents correspondent, bodies of correspondence, manuscripts. And so these really shape, of course, why people come and use Leo Beck because uh, you know, they wanna access these particular things. So it's, it's largely fueled by what we have. And we try and promote it. For example, we have an active Facebook page. Uh, we have an Instagram account. So we're trying much more to get the word out there. You know, in the old days, I actually kind of, this before my time, but how, long, my, how long have you been there? I've been there since 2002. Wow. 2000, yeah, a long time. Since my 20th year. And actually, uh, the anniversary is coming up in September. Wow. 20 years. Yeah. And so, um, so they, so, you know, we get this material and that, of course, uh, makes a difference on, you know, 
uh, people here, we have this particular material. I, in the old days, that's what I was going to say. They actually, I think they want, before my time, they wanted to be kind of a small, isolated, academic library. They very much talked about German Jewish scholarship of the late 19th and early 20th century, I would say, and even earlier, like Moses Mendelssohn, the Enlightenment, all this kind of thing, Heinrich Heine. So they actually um, always made sure that they individuated themselves from institutions that were focused on the Holocaust, actually. And so the Holocaust, of course, is always a big topic. I mean, for a lot of Americans, Jewish history in Germany is about the Holocaust. They actually don't know about other aspects of that history. Um, and, and so, so, and we do want to answer and deal with that history too, which we can do mostly through books and also through some archival things that we do have. But of course, uh, we don't, I would say we have large bodies of artifacts from the Nazi exterminate, from the Holocaust, except for um, Theresienstadt, because so many people comparatively did survive in Theresienstadt. So you, you know, I get your newsletter, uh -huh. um, electronic newsletter. So that's clearly one way that you, that our audience can come and be connected to you. Mm -hmm. Who is sponsoring, who is the donor base that's keeping you guys running? Well, it's private donations. You know, we have a board. We have um, uh, we have a donation drive sometimes, and um, we also get some money from grants. We get some money from um, uh, German grant money mm -hmm. sometimes. It's really helpful. Are you are you getting any money from the German government for the work that you're doing because of because what happened to uh, sort of a reparations? I don't know if the right word is. Yeah, I mean, they don't call it's not called that per se. But yes, right. I think, you know, we do get financial support from the German government and I and um, uh, for obvious reasons. Yeah. So, so you've been with the organization 20 years. So congratulations. Uh -huh. So I'd Thank like you. to know a little bit about your background. You obviously started uh, in the uh, microfilm area. Right. So were you in video or were you in sort of the creative arts that you got you involved in? How did you wind <laughs> up, how did you wind up knocking on the door of uh, Leo Beck? Which Leo you... Beck. Well, you know, when I was in, I'm from Minnesota and- um, you know, I spent, you know, I spent 15 years in Minnesota. I know, it's, it's bizarre, isn't it? Yeah, so it's funny when I found that out. And I, um, I'm from Minnesota, I'm not Jewish. And uh, what happened really was I, um, when I was in high school, I had become very interested in the Holocaust and European history in general, but I was actually more on the literature side of things. I was actually- What was your trigger literature. that you got involved in the Holocaust? You know, it happened so much over time. I, if I can remember like, early years, so to say, <laughs> it was probably going to the library, to tell you the truth, like small town library and discovering books like um, the diary of Anne Frank and, and books about the concentration camps and what had happened. And I grew up in a very um, Lutheran Christian environment. And so I became interested because this always was jarring to me that um, that that the Holocaust had happened in a quote unquote Christian nation. I mean, this is a very young me, mm -hmm. not so how old were how old were you understanding the world how, and how it worked. How oh, old were you? Sixth grade, maybe fifth. Wow. So when you went to your parents and you brought these questions to your parents, what was the engagement like? I'm sure they were they were shocked. They were, yes, yes, it was very strange. <laughs> it was very strange to have a son who was so interested in this subject. They didn't really know what to do. They were, they were very supportive about it and got me books and stuff and, uh, and brought me to little events in Minneapolis about it even. I remember once there was some 
photography show faces of survivors. You know, these shows are once in a while they come up. Yep. And I remember they brought me there. It was there in St. Louis Park somewhere at the Jewish Community Center. Yep. And uh, and actually, I began talking about the Holocaust as I went into high school a lot. And I knew a lot about the Holocaust. So, at, you know, I would say more than the teachers. That sounds kind of mean. Well, but... I can, let me just step back a second. I know when you were growing up in Minnesota, it wasn't a very Jewish uh, no. state. No, it and certainly in fact, was In fact, St. Louis Park, what used to be called St. Jewish Park, uh, by the by the by the Jews of local uh, orientation, but certainly there was a lot of anti-Semitism in Minnesota. A lot. In uh, fact, Minnesota had the I, in 1940, I think it was considered the most anti-Semitic state in America. Right. Yeah. Right. So it's Very it's bad. really fascinating that you're bringing you know your background and in, in your interest goes all the way back to the sixth grade. It's fascinating. Yeah. And so what, what yeah, did, where did you go to, strange. where did you go to school? Where did you go to your, where did you go to university? I think you froze. Oh, you froze. I'm sorry. How about now? Are you there? Hold on a second. <laughs> 